Hello, my name is Martin Horn, and I'm bringing you a very necessary video today. This is a video that's going to dispel the myths of these high dollar bikes and give you some very practical and very useful information in purchasing the bike that you need. This video is intended for the recreational cyclist, which means everyone except a racing cyclist. If you are a serious racing cyclist, this video is not for you. Unless, of course, you want to listen to the, the practical side of cycling. The reason I'm making this video is because I have seen the deterioration of cycling through this high dollar bike market. The high dollar bike market makes absolutely no sense to the recreational cyclist, yet they are still going out spending thousands and thousands of dollars more than they need to. So after watching this video, you're going to know exactly what's going on in the bike world market today and how you can easily get into cycling for very little money. Now I've watched cycling deteriorate from a fitness sport into a equipment sport and it's pretty sickening. So we're going to deal with practical equipment for the day. All that you need, all that's dependable, and I have thoroughly tested the equipment that I have been speaking of. Since I ride 12 to 15,000 miles a year on these bikes, they have been thoroughly tested. If they weren't dependable, or whatever wasn't dependable, has broken and failed. Most of the time, I can tell whether these parts were any good, and I removed them before I even rode on them. So, let's get started. Everybody who has seen my videos before knows that I am riding a racing bike that's called a Wellington 2.0. The stock bike cost $350 delivered straight to my door and complete. With this, with this bike, I have ridden tens of thousands of miles. The only thing I've replaced is the wheels and of course tires, any natural wearing parts. And I've replaced parts that didn't fit me, such as the handlebar width. Other than that, I have used this bike <clears throat> in the extremes in the Northern California mountains and have enjoyed an extremely dependable bike for the base cost of $350. <clears throat> I'm going to discuss uh, what the base cost is and what the actual riding costs are later. But first I want to dispel this myth of high dollar bikes. So the first bike we're looking at here is a bike I purchased for $300. It's a hybrid bike made out of aluminum and it was a, I still ride it today. It's a couple years old. It now has over 10,000 miles on it. Been through a couple of sets of tires. And this bike has been extremely dependable. But the $300 cost is not what I actually paid to get the bike up and running. Because I am 195 pounds and highly skilled cyclist, I can transfer power on a, through the drivetrain on a bike. And if the crank set's weak or a chain is weak or especially the wheels are weak, they will fail. And in this case, the uh, wheels failed right away and the crank set I never even gave a chance to. I replaced it before I even, before I even used it once. I added my own choice of pedals, which were SPD, and I replaced the wheels. So the $300 price was the way to get in the door, but I also had to spend an $120 on a set of wheels, an extra $60 on a crank set. And with those components and my uh, SPD pedals, 
that boosts the costs up to about $600. That's the actual riding cost of the bike to get it up and running. And that's the case on any bike, no matter what you, no matter how much you pay. Next, we're going to move on to a, one of my favorite values there are, and this is the Motobacon that's, that's for sale on bikesdirect.com. This is $650, and this bike is ready to ride. The wheels are strong. The crank are, is strong. The, uh, the frame is, is lightweight. It only, this is about a 21-pound bike. This bike has absolutely everything the recreational cyclist could ever want for $650 right out the door. The only thing you're going to add to it is your choice of pedals and, of course, your hydration system. And, of course, I'm going to talk about the rest of um, uh, the options later. So the question is, why is this bike worth $8,000? Why is this bike worth $11,500? What could you possibly be getting between this bike and this bike, or this bike and this bike. Here we have a Trek, um, one of, uh, I think it's a Trek, and it costs $11,500. And next to it is the bike I bought for $300. Now the one on the left may be a usable bike, the way it's built up, it may not. I'm not sure. Of course, I've already explained the one on the right. The gravity that I purchased, purchased is more at a practical riding price of $600. So we're actually comparing $600 to $11,500. But we still got a nearly an $11,000 difference. So what are we getting for $11,000? That should be a good question to everyone. So not only is this Trek $11,500 when I compare it to a motorcycle that I bought in, uh, in the year 2000 I purchased a Kawasaki Ninja 250 and it cost me $3,000 today that bike costs $4,000 so in 2013 we are comparing a bicycle to a motorcycle and we find that we can buy three motorcycles to the price of this one bicycle. So what in the world is making this bicycle worth so much more than the, than the motorcycle? Is it R&D, research and development? Is it the cost of these components and the labor to build it? They're both mass production bikes. So why does the Kawasaki, which has a much more complex R&D to it because it's using an engine that runs at 15,000 RPMs. It has a fuel system. It has a water cooling system. It has a hydraulic brake system. It has a six-speed transmission. And it has basically everything the bike does plus an engine. It has disc brakes, front and rear. It has mirrors. So what's the difference? Well, that you can always say, well, the, the bike bicycle is a racing bike. It's a top-end racing bike, and of course, the Kawasaki is a recreational bike. But I'm still asking the question, why does the Trek cost $11,500? As we move into just the transmission costs on bikes like these, a Durace shifter may cost you $700. The crank set made out of carbon is gonna, can run up to $2,000. Just the shifting cassette gears can be $500 and the chain $100. So in, uh, in the main component range, we've already eaten up, oh, we could say up to $4,000 by the time they get handlebars, seat, seat post, and pedals on here. So the rest is wheels and frame. 
So what does it cost to produce a frame? On the left is a, is a normal Trek production bike that costs $6,000. It's one of their top of the line racing bikes. And then I look at what the people in China that, that made that build some of these bikes. Now I'm, I'm singling, I have a Trek pictured here, but every single manufacturer has a bike that costs this much. And we're trying to figure out, you know, whether this is worth spending for anyone, racer or recreational cyclist. And when I discover the China wages that it takes to assemble a bike like this, you find out that they make approximately $500 a year in a 40-hour work week. And that's if they work 50 weeks a year. That's $2 a day or 25%, 25 cents an hour. Now, how many frames can these guys build in a day? Even if they built a frame per day, we're talking a $2 labor cost. So we have $2, plus we have the material of a carbon fiber, <clears throat> We have shipping costs, and we have import taxes. So what's this really? What's this bike really cost? is is hard to say. But uh, whether it's worth six thousand dollars, I say no. So next, let's compare apples to oranges. We're going to take my favorite value on the market today, and that's the Motovacan Grand Record at $650, and compare it to the Trek that cost $11,500. Uh, as you can see in the picture, they both look like bicycles. They both look like racing bicycles. They both have the same, pretty much the same frame angles. They're both racing frame angles. They have straight blade forks. They have a set of wheels. They have three main sets of critical bearings, and that's the bearings in the front and rear hubs and the bearings in the crank set. And then you have the bearings in the headset and then minor bushing bearings that might be in the shifters and what have you. Now, considering that the uh, Kawasaki motorcycle I had turns at 15,000 RPMs, I would think the bearing races in that would have to be very accurate or the engine would self-destruct. Now we're talking bearing races on a bicycle that's going to turn at about a maximum of 120 RPM. Much, much lower. All we're looking for is a good bearing surface. I have bought good bearing surfaces from Campagnolo for a long time and uh, those were perfect bearing surfaces. So what What's it cost to actually produce a few bearing surfaces for the front and rear hub, the crank, and the and the headset? You can you can guess that it doesn't take as much or as much skill for a crank that's turning a hundred RPM as a as a crank on a motorcycle that's turning fifteen thousand RPM plus with a whole lot more torque behind it. So next we're looking at a, at the, uh, you know, the bearings are the same. We still have some type of bearing to drive both of these bikes. They both have seats. A seat is a fit component, something you would pick yourself anyway. They both have handlebars and shifters. I have found these shifters on these low price bikes to be very good. Uh, I, I owned high-end components before, Campanulo Super Record, Shimano Durace, and Shimano Ultegra. The Shimano uh, Ultegra and Durace self-destructed and um, pretty much trashed, trashed my bike. Uh, the, uh, the Ultegra was always dropping chains off the front chain ring and even though I'm a very good mechanic, I took it to the to a professional mechanic. They couldn't make it work. I couldn't make it work. And finally, the chain dropped off the front, which made it walk up the rear and into the spokes. And it bent the chain, sheared off the derailleur, and ruined the rear wheel, bent, cracked off the 
derailleur hanger and uh, pretty much destroyed the bike. And that's the last time I ever used high dollar components. Ever since I've been using the low dollar stuff, I haven't had any problems whatsoever. The Durace I used in Race Across America kept dropping chains, kept skipping gears on the rear, and gave me all kinds of problems too. So as far as component-wise, I don't see what you're getting. Obviously, the, the two weights are going to be different. The $11,500 bike is carbon fiber. The Moto Pecan is aluminum. The Moto Pecan weighs in around 21 pounds, which, was a, which is a good racing weight. The track is probably a sub, could be as light as 12 pounds, I'm not sure. So we're talking a 10 pound difference. So what kind of weight, uh, with, the, with the weight difference, what, what does it really matter? For, for the recreational cyclist, the weight only matters on an uphill and an acceleration. And since we are not in a peloton, and we are not, um, we're not accelerating and deaccelerating all day long in a peloton. The weight only matters on hills. And since you are climbing at a consistent rate on a hill, again, the weight doesn't really matter all that much. We must consider next, uh, you'll notice that there's no engine on these bikes. Whether you pay 11,500 or 650, you can see there's there's nothing there. The frame is empty. So next we got to decide what kind of engine are we putting on this bike? Are we going to use engine A or do we have engine B or do we have something in between? To put an engine A on a $11,500 bike would make absolutely no difference in speed between the Trek and the Motobacan. So even though you've just spent an extra $11,000 on a bike, you are not gaining any speed if you're driving it with engine A. Engine B, with the proper amount of skill, can take advantage of the lighter weight bike. And again, this is only for racing. A recreational cyclist on the Moto Pecan will do just fine in the uh, spirited club rides where you're riding with other people. So again, the weight doesn't matter. And uh, so we're, we're, we're looking at two different frame materials. Both frame materials cannot be repaired when bent. Both frame materials cannot be aligned. Only steel bikes can be aligned after they're built. On a, on, and after they're crashed. You crash carbon fiber bike and it breaks, you're going to have to replace the frame. You crash an aluminum bike and it bends, or it, it, you're going to have to replace the frame. That makes you wonder why they ever started building aluminum bikes, since steel is so much better. Now, when comparing weight to alignment of a bike, the weight becomes very in inconsequential. An alignment of the frame, an alignment of the wheels within the frame, is far more important than weight. And if you took these two bikes, and even though the Trek may weigh 10 pounds less, if it's out of alignment and, or, and the wheels are out of alignment, it will be a much, much slower bike and the motobacon if the motobacon is completely aligned. Alignment is never spoke of in the bicycle industry. And it is the most important. You can easily lose three to four to five miles an hour on a badly aligned bike. You take a badly aligned frame, you take wheels that aren't dished properly and are not uh, lined up in the frame, you have wheels that don't track right, and then you have a wheel frame that's twisted and it's pulling, actually dragging your wheel, depending on how bad the frame is misaligned, you will be dragging your bike along and you will lose five miles an hour on a bike like that. So you put identical riders on these two bikes, 
And what do you get? Well, if you put a skilled writer on these two bikes, you will find that there's probably an average speed of two to three miles an hour for every hour of riding. Take an average skilled rider, not a high skilled rider, and there may be one to one and a half mile an hour difference in an hour's ride. Take a low skilled bicyclist and there's no difference whatsoever. So what are we talking for, for the recreational cyclist? If they spend this kind of money on a bike, what do they actually get? Well, the average rider will increase their speed maybe one and a half miles per hour for every hour you've ridden. So if you normally could ride, uh, an average rider would do maybe 17 miles in an hour on a bike. Now they can do 18 and a half. And that's only if the route is hilly and mountainous. If it's a flat route, that number goes down to something so inconsequential that is not even worth talking about. There's no speed difference whatsoever on a flat route between these two bikes because we're only talking weight difference. And of course, if they are uh, aligned exactly the same, if they're both properly aligned bikes. Now you don't know what you're gonna get for alignment. You have no idea unless you know a frame builder and can put the frame on an alignment jig and they can check it. An aluminum frame cannot be fixed, but a steel frame can be somewhat realigned on a jig. So again, we're, I'm talking alignment, which is never talked about. So basically, the next part is the head tube angles. These are racing bikes. So if a, if a low skilled person chooses one of these high dollar racing bikes, they will be on a frame that they cannot really have the skills to handle. They will actually be slower on the expensive bike than they will be on, a, on the hybrid bike, as I pictured at the beginning, the uh, gravity hybrid bike. They would actually be faster on, this, on the hybrid bike than on this $11,000, $500 racing bike because of the frame angles. The frame angles are built for high-skilled riders and they will not be able to steer a straight course down the road. They will be weaving back and forth very horribly. This will cut their speed down another two miles an hour and uh, basically just weaving your way back and forth all the way down the road. So now, this, this poor man who uh, has no skill but lots of money just bought a bike that's actually slower than than the uh, $300 uh, hybrid bike. Now the actual cost of the bike, as you can see, these two bikes come complete. Everything's there, which is absolutely ridiculous. Bikes should, you know, after you reach a certain price range on a bike, the rider is going to know exactly what they want, and the bike is not going to come equipped exactly the way they want. An experienced rider will want to have the correct handlebar width. They will have their tire that they will, they will only use one set of tires because that's, that's what they've found that they like. Their gearing choice will be extremely uh, precise. The kind of saddle they use the kind of crank set length and gearing they're using, and the, the wheels and how the wheels are built up. All these will be the choice of an experienced cyclist. So none of these components should come on the bike. So if you're buying an expensive bike, and it comes with a crank set that costs $2,000, but the crank arms are longer than what you normally would ride, you just lost two thousand dollars. You have to you have to try and sell that crank for whatever you can get, <clears throat> and then buy another two thousand dollar crank to replace it. <clears throat> and same way with cassettes. I mean, the cassette costs on an expensive bike can be five hundred dollars. So the cassette gearing, if that's not correct either, that will have to be replaced. 
and if, <clears throat> if the wheels are too light or or just not the wheels you're accustomed to riding you'll be replacing those too so after you add this all up even if you've spent eleven thousand five hundred dollars on a bike you still may be replacing up to with wheel costs you could spend and crank set costs you could easily spend another five or six thousand dollars getting the bike to fit you and to have components on it that you're used to and trust and having gearing which is the most important part uh, that matches what you want to ride so not only are these expensive bikes high in cost but the people that would buy them aren't even wanting them equipped the way they are. So the bike should come simply as a, as a frame with options. Now the Moto Pecan at $650 costs far less to get it in a, in a rideable condition. The wheels are already strong. There's no reason to replace them unless you want a very lightweight set. The crank set's already, already strong, but if it has the wrong gearing or the wrong crank arm length, it only costs $65 to replace it. And if, of course, the cassette is, is not, is not uh, the gearing you want either, as a nine-speed cassette, it only costs about $30 to replace that and maybe thirty to fifty dollars to replace the handlebars if they're the wrong width. So at the very most you're going to spend only a few hundred dollars to get this motocon up and running to even your most precise specifications. And finally the total cost of riding for the recreational cyclist is the bike and that gets you started but of course there's many things that the engine needs the engine needs a good pair of shorts for uh, any distances greater than 20 miles the in, the uh, your skin's going to wear off if you don't have a good fitting pair of shorts uh, gloves to with a good heavy duty padding in them is needed to keep your hands from going numb. Also, many uh, you want to be switching between uh, riding positions with your hands. Uh, the trouble with today's clothes are you're going to find that that the padding in the gloves where they need it the most have been put it in the shorts where you need it the least. A short pair of shorts with the uh, heavy duty padding does not breathe and it uh, it is a ridiculous invention today i have to use triathlon shorts which are designed for swimming and running and riding to get a thin chamois in there that breathes uh, it is a ridiculous design for these road shorts today uh, a jersey is is necessary i because i want the three pockets in the back i have things that I continue to take off, such as my glasses and things to uh, when I'm climbing hills. And I like to have those pockets available at all times. You get that with a jersey. Also, you want the jersey to fit. If you're concerned about performance, you want the jersey to fit very tight. Any movement in clothes will cut your speed down very quickly. Most of you will also want a helmet. And of course, you're going to want uh, any serious cyclist or or mid recreational cyclist, uh, you're going. To, I'm going to encourage you to get uh, clipless, cleated shoes so that your feet are attached to the pedals. It's a uh, it's not only a safety issue, but you are going to lose valuable pedal strokes, and the uh, the style of pedal strokes. You're going to lose that if your feet are not clipped to the pedals. The safety thing is uh, if you are on a bike traveling 25 miles an hour and you're standing up to go over a hill and you are not locked into your pedals and you slip off, 
it's going to be a very dangerous and injurious situation. So it's much safer to be locked into the pedals, believe it or not. And for uh, cyclists that uh, want um, more positions on their bike, a aero bar setup is always great. So the aero bars would be added. So in addition to just the price of the bike, you will be looking at the price for shorts, jerseys, gloves, a hydration system, whether it's a, a backpack or water bottles, and you'll need water bottles and water bottle cages. Aero bars if you want them. Most of you are going to buy helmets, and you're going to want to buy special socks that breathe so that your, your feet will not, to, uh, will not give you problems. You're going to want the shoes that fit the uh, clipless pedals. Uh, cycling shoes are make, uh, make riding, again, much more enjoyable, just like a good pair of shorts will. You're also going to want a, a series of a set of tools for maintaining your bike and a small set of tools for repair on the road. After uh, 40 years of cycling, I've come up with a small set of tools that, <clears throat> that uh, pretty much solve most of my problems on the road. So the toolkit will include uh, tire levers, a glueless patch kit, a chain braking tool, a small series of uh, Allen wrenches, hex nut wrenches, uh, one extra tube, and a small bicycle pump. Uh, also a, uh, a multi-use uh, uh, spoke wrench. And uh, with these tools, you can repair just about anything that goes wrong with the bike on the road. Uh, the one thing I don't carry is the large wrench needed to uh, tighten crank arms on. I use a tapered bottom bracket on my, all my bikes and they need a large Allen wrench to crank those on. So since I don't take the large wrench with me, I do take an extra bolt because I have had these crank arms back off and lose bolts before and have to pedal home with one crank arm. And of course, um, you're going to want to pick certain components that you like. You're going to pick a seat that you like. I don't have that listed here. And you're going to pick tires that you like. Tires are one of the most important things you're going to add to the bike. Because if you don't want to be changing flats all the time, you're going to need a high quality flat resistant tire. And I been suggesting the specialized Armadillo series as the best tires in the world. These tires will cost a lot of money, 50, 40 to $50 each, but uh, from what everything else on the market there is, it's the best there is. So now that with that in mind, I gave it a $525 price, and that is, uh, that is for buying uh, components and pedals and shoes that don't cost all that much. You know, maybe $50 for shorts, $50 for a jersey, shoes $50 to $100, helmet $50, aero bars $50, gloves $20, uh, water bottle cages about $8 each. Most of the time uh, I carry anywhere from four, uh, two to four water bottles on my bike, depending how far into the mountains I'm going. And it comes out to about, uh, with... Uh, with the specialized tires comes out to about an extra $525 on top of the price of the bike. So as you can see, you can start with a $650 bike and you will, may have to add anywhere from $500 to $1,000 on top of that by the time you're actually out on the road riding and prepared for uh, mechanical breakdowns and flat tires. So the actual cost of riding, if you chose this Motobacan Grand Record at $650,
and you needed to uh, replace a crank set and handlebars and then buy all the other accessories needed we are up into the 12 13 14 hundred dollar 15 hundred dollar range Now for anybody riding bike trails, five miles, 10 miles at the most, most of these things are not necessary. You can buy just about any bike, have it fit you badly, and still be able to ride five miles down a flat bike trail and come back without very many problems. And that, I hope, is clearing up some of the mysteries between these high dollar bikes. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Bye.